the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, Episode 71. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you. And just a reminder, you can find us on not only iTunes, but Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. So if you can't get enough of my beautiful voice, TuneIn Radio has us playing all the time. Now, today, we're going to have on Christian Ruby to talk about your electric and what's going on just in general with the electric industry in Europe. We kind of cover a lot of things here. We talk about nuclear and some of the problems that it's facing in Europe. And we also talk about, you know, renewables and where they're heading. Um, And I think we're going to get him on again here in a month or two to speak about electric cars and what's going on there. He told me some interesting stuff offline. Without further ado, here is the Secretary General of Euro Electric, Mr. Christian Ruby. Well, Christian, how's it going today? It's so good to have you on the program. Thank you. Very good. Enjoying life here in Brussels. Slightly cloudy, but um, but we're um, we're coming towards the end of the political season, so we're looking at a very quiet August before we kick off the rest of the year, where we have a lot of big stuff coming up, the negotiations of the clean energy package, and and uh, an exciting new uh, transport package coming up um, to to help boost electrification in Europe. Yes, I know you're very involved in you know European electrical issues, uh, electrification of Europe. Kind of from our U.S. audience and maybe our global audience. Walk us through where is Europe? I know there's a lot of debates on you know renewables and getting power from Russia, and just kind of give us a thirty thousand foot view on what's going on with just a just general energy issues in Europe. Well, I think um, if if you take the helicopter view, what's what's really happening in Europe is that Europe is is moving on with its energy transition, meaning it's a transition from conventional uh, energy systems towards a more sustainable. Uh, mainly uh, renewable, but in any case, a decarbonized energy system. Evidently, that's a long process because uh, we come from a fully conventional system not so many years ago. And, um, and it's a big, uh, let's say, challenge. It's a big task to, to reorient uh, and, and um, refocus the, the energy system um, to a, a decarbonized one. But, um, but basically, Europe is, is moving along at a, at a very steady pace here. Uh, what we're seeing today is that we have uh, in electricity already um, 30% renewables. We have uh, 26% uh, nuclear, which means that electricity in Europe is almost to 60% carbon-free uh, energy. And that means that if we want to do uh, the transformation of, of the entire economy towards low-carbon energy, we have a very good shot at doing that by shifting gradually energy consumption towards electricity. And that's what this uh, electrification agenda is about. Electrification is, is not only about decarbonization, it's also very much about energy security, because uh, today we import a lot of gas in Europe. Uh, we also import uh, quite a bit of oil. And um, if we want to move away from that dependence uh, on uh, unstable uh, regions uh, and, and imports from the outside, we need to shift to domestic sources of, of power uh, and energy, and renewable energy is certainly one of those that we can shift to. So this is also very much a, a security of supply issue and a security of supply agenda for Europe. Now, you mentioned nuclear in there. I'm just curious. I've heard some mixed reports about what the status of nuclear is in Europe. Um, some people say that there's a positive outlook, and I've heard others say that you know nuclear plants are, be, are going to be shut down. Um, what's your stance on where nuclear will fit into the European energy outlook for the next decade? Well, um, as I said, today we have a very significant chunk of our electricity coming from nuclear, and, and that chunk is also a, uh, a low-carbon or non-carbon chunk, uh, which is extremely important when we look at, at the climate challenge uh, we're facing uh, in Europe and in- internationally. So what's the outlook on the uh, uh, nuclear industry as such? Seen from a electric point of view, we're a, um, uh, what we call a technology-neutral Association, so we don't uh, uh, judge uh, or prejudge uh, technologies as such, but we're concerned and and we're um, uh, we're concerned about making sure that the technologies we have in in the electricity mix contribute to our uh, overall uh, societal goals, which I- include climate action, which include energy security, which include uh, affordable electricity, uh, and so on and so forth. 
If we look at the nuclear industry, I think we, um, we can see that uh, this has been in Europe a very uh, successful industry historically. Uh, we have uh, more than 150 uh, nuclear power stations in Europe, and they uh, contribute quite uh, significantly to our um, electricity supply. What we also see is that, um, that the industry is facing some challenges uh, of different kinds. Uh, one is that um, if we look at um, cost trends, uh, renewables are becoming cheaper and cheaper at a very, very steady pace, whereas uh, nuclear is looking at a consolidating industry and, um, and seeing a lot of um, delay on, on big projects which means uh, higher costs and uh, which means challenges when it comes to cost competitiveness for nuclear. Another um, challenge the, the industry is looking at is that um, we're seeing fewer suppliers in the market. Uh, we've seen some of the very big uh, nuclear uh, equipment suppliers uh, opt out of the industry for different reasons. Uh, Toshiba, Westinghouse are um, discontinuing their, their, um, their activities in this field. And, and that means that the supply base uh, is becoming smaller, and that also means less competition, which is, of course, worrying if, if you're looking at competitive and, and um, uh, affordable um, replacement of, of various uh, types of, of nuclear equipment. A third challenge we've, we're seeing, uh, I think, to be fair, is that nuclear does have some very significant public acceptance issues in Europe. Uh, this follows, of course, uh, Fukushima, but also um, more domestic issues. Um, we're seeing an aging fleet of nuclear uh, plants in Europe, and I think uh, it is becoming uh, an increasingly uh, serious issue for nuclear that, um, that uh, in many countries uh, there is a, a public acceptance issue. Okay, uh, that's helpful for that. Thank you. Um, let's talk about renewables now. I think you said earlier that renewables were 20 or 30 percent of, of the uh, market right now in Europe. That's correct. Okay, so are we talking, uh, what, what percentage of that, just kind of a loose number, is solar and wind? And kind of break down that. And then what are you seeing as far as some of the pros and some of the cons that y'all had, uh, had to work through when implementing renewable solutions? So, so in, 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 let's say, um, in very general figures, uh, uh, let's say uh, rule of thumb figures, uh, we have around 10% uh, wind when we look at uh, electricity consumption. And by the way, the 30% are of the electricity mix. Okay. And okay. electricity um, covers around 20% of the overall energy consumption in society. So you still have energy consumption, of course, from industry. You have energy consumption from um, uh, from uh, transport, and you have it also from, from the heating sector. So electricity um, covers around 20% of the total. Now, of those, we have 30% renewables. Um, hydropower, so hydro dams, hydroelectricity, cover around 13% of that. Then we have 10% wind, and I would estimate around 5% um, solar, and the rest is... is uh, is shared amongst uh, various different uh, sources. And when in wind, um, are, are most of these wind farms at sea, and you're bringing the energy in, or do you have large wind farms on on shore as well? So uh, the big majority of wind in Europe is decentralized uh, onshore wind. So uh, the history of uh, wind uh, power in Europe is that um, this grew uh, from from being uh, very small decentralized installations with very small turbine sizes uh, back in the 80s, then uh, growing steadily into a more, let's say, reliable, bigger machines in the 90s uh, and uh, becoming big scale energy in the 2000s. Um, so recently we've uh, added to uh, the mix in Europe also the offshore industry, which has really taken off massively over, I would say, the last five to seven years uh, and I think this has been uh, an almost unbelievable success story, how fast this has gone and how fast the costs have come down. I was uh, the chief policy officer, so the political director of uh, Wind Europe, the, the industry body for, for wind energy before I joined your electric. And I remember when we did a huge um, offshore wind event back in 2015, just around the time when I joined that association. Now, so that's... That's just more than two years ago. Back then, we were saying, okay, by 2020, 
this industry with a humongous effort can bring down costs uh, of, of uh, offshore wind to 100 euros per megawatt hour. Today, we're seeing projects being implemented at 60, 70 euros, uh, 80 euros. So, so the industry uh, has really outpaced itself and, and really, uh, let's say, over-delivered on its own um, commitments on cost reductions to an almost uh, incredible uh, extent. So, um, so, so this is really interesting. And going forward, I think there's a lot of uh, potential in, in the offshore business because uh, essentially, uh, even wind has public acceptance issues. When you get a big, big turbine in your backyard, you're going to say, "No, I don't want that." Uh, and 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 you face just uh, you, you face the same issues as with other uh, generation technologies. You don't have that at sea, and that's why offshore wind is very attractive. In that sense, also, it's very attractive because you get economies of scale to a completely different extent. The biggest uh, offshore projects today in Europe around 1200 megawatts that is really a huge project that's that's as big as as the nuclear uh, units go and that's that's comparable to a, a major coal power plant now earlier on you mentioned decarbonization when you think when we you know when I hear decarbonization I've kind of I have some thoughts on what that might mean what do you what do you mean when you say decarbonization are you talking about um you know but just for transitioning from fossil fuels to more renewables or are you talking about uh, you know taxing or what what all is included when you say decarbonization well, uh, decarbonization generally describes um, the, the process of uh, making sure that, um, that running our economy in general uh, is not associated with emissions of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. That's what decarbonization means. How do you decarbonize? There's a technological aspect to this, and there's, of course, a political aspect to this. Uh, what policies uh, can you implement to drive decarbonization? And what technologies uh, can you basically apply to 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 um, to ensure that uh, economy uh, decarbonizes over time? But essentially, decarbonization means um, moving to a uh, carbon-free or at least carbon-neutral economy. And I'm assuming now I'm just going to take a stab at the dark here, but I'm assuming a lot of this, at least from a European standpoint, is coming from the Paris Treaty, is it, or or is there other initiatives that maybe we're not aware of that are pushing this agenda too? No, that's 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 correct. I mean, uh, the Paris uh, Agreement is, of course, uh, the latest of a number of international agreements uh, that um, basically are are the main driver in this. Um, from back from the Kyoto Protocol, which, uh, or you could even start at at, at the UNFCCC um, uh, Convention of Climate Change um, from from ninety two. But so so that's that's essentially where everything started with the. Um, uh, with Rio uh, 1992 and, and the Framework Convention on Climate Change under the UN. Uh, from there, we have the uh, Kyoto uh, Treaty. We have uh, all the follow-up agreements to the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we have the 2009 uh, Copenhagen Agreement, and we have uh, as the latest uh, one uh, the Paris Agreement. And, and these are the ones, let's say, in an international context driving this. Of course, then at EU level, you have a whole body of... Uh, let's say, um, EU legislation that is uh, the, uh, let's say, de facto driver of, of uh, investment decisions in Europe, because the framework convention and, and the international treaties, they don't put in firm law what companies need to do. That's, uh, that's basically decided at EU level exactly what companies need to do, exactly how much they can emit and, and how this is regulated in more detail. Absolutely. Okay, that's helpful for me, for our listeners. Um, you know, one thing is, you know, you, from the U.S., we have our way our government works, and you get outside the U.S., you're always trying to figure out how all these things work and how they connect together, and it's uh, it's always a learning process, at least for, at least for me. Um, now I know that you've been kind of connected with, um, as I mentioned earlier, with politics in Europe. You're currently with uh, Euro Electric. You're the secretary general there. What are you guys doing there at Euro Electric? So Euro Electric is the industry body for electricity in Europe. So we're an industry association. Uh, comparable to uh, the Edison Institute in the U.S. or to, you know, to the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce or, or any other major industry body. Now, what we do is that we, we, um, we represent uh, around 3,500 companies, uh, electricity companies in Europe, covering the entire value chain from generation uh, to, to retail and distribution of electricity. Uh, we 
Um, we have all the big generators. We have the distributors. Uh, we have the traders. Uh, everybody represented in our association. And and what we do is we basically talk on behalf of this industry in Europe, uh, Europe and represent the industry vis-a-vis -vis, uh, policymakers. Okay, great. Now, I see that you are on Twitter, which is a place that I love to be at, and it's at Christian Ruby. That's Christian with a K. We will link to that in the show notes so the listeners can get the spelling right. What else would you like to plug or promote today before we let you go? Well, um, just to say what, what um, you Electric really, really cares a lot about is electrification. And what does that mean? Well, electrification is essentially the process of bringing more electricity into the overall energy mix. And why is that a good idea? Well, that's because electricity is the cleanest energy carrier we have today. If you compare electricity to gas or to oil, um, you basically have two energy carriers there that you can't decarbonize. You can't end up with oil being clean oil or being decarbonized oil. That's not going to exist because you're not going to be able to tank your car and then basically have no emissions coming from the tailpipe uh, or, or from the exhaust. Same with gas. Um, there is a theoretical potential to, to um, decarbonize gas, but it has, it's in, in the very long term that this is going to uh, be possible. Different is uh, electricity in the sense that if we add enough renewables, if we add enough low carbon sources to the electricity mix, you have the chance of having a carbon-free energy carrier. Uh, and why is that attractive? That's attractive because essentially you, you, can, you can then solve the societal issue re, uh, relating to, to uh, climate change. Uh, and you can also use this energy carrier in other areas. For example, uh, for electric cars. If we electrify the entire uh, car fleet, you're going to see a massive drop in, um, in CO2 emissions, but also uh, in air pollution and all the other bad side effects coming from um, from combustion engine cars. So so there's a lot of societal benefit to, to essentially to electrifying. And by the way, and we don't mind that. Uh, that's also going to mean more business for uh, the electricity industry. So so that's that's essentially what what drives our uh, policy asks uh, at European level. We see um, we see electricity becoming decarbonized, and therefore we we strongly believe uh, that that we should uh, let's say. Uh, expand the use of this energy carry in other sectors that are currently using more polluting, more uh, dirty energy carriers uh, than electricity are. So, um, so that's essentially um, what we're all about. And you can find them at yourelectric.org. That's e u r e l e c t r i c dot o r g. We will link to that in the show notes, and you can um, also find them on Twitter under the same handle at your electric. Well, Christian, it's been so uh, good to hear from you today and to learn more about what's going on in Europe. Uh, it's a topic that I always find interesting. Thank you so much for coming on, and we look forward to having you on again in the future. Sure. Take care. Christian, thanks again for coming on. And question of the day time, folks, what do you think about nuclear? Will it actually have a place in Europe over the next decade, or will we see it be disbanded? Ryan at GlobalEnergyMedia.com. That is the way to get in touch with me, Ryan at GlobalEnergyMedia.com, and we will read your answer on the air. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global. 